average human being, when your views are obviously white supremacist garbage, what do you do? You take four steps in order to legitimize yourself. Step number one, the Trump gambit. First, you declare your allegiance to President Trump and declare that you're not really alt-right, even though you obviously are. You show up to lectures wearing a MAGA hat in order to get the media to cover it and in order to demonstrate that you are truly a representative of the 63 million Trump voters. You call yourself America first, hijacking Trump's slogan. What you actually mean is white Americans first. The media eat it up because the media love nothing better than, of course, lumping Trump in with particularly this group. You don't have to take my word for it. You can just ask Andrew Anglin, the neo-Nazi who runs the Daily Stormer. He posted a calendar of events for alt-righters to attend and attack, including this particular event. And he wrote last week, quote, I think basically we've got a model going forward that is going to work. If we get questions, we'll take questions. But simply being there and heckling in the audience relentlessly is extremely effective. And you can meet other like-minded people there this way as well. Remember, we're all good optics, na American nationalists now. Longtime readers will remember this is something I pushed very hard while others were dressing up in neo-Nazi costumes. And by talking about these issues, instead of saying, gas the kikes or whatever, we are more or less immune to being fired or kicked out of school if doxxed. You just, if, if somebody calls you alt-right, you say, no, of course I'm not an alt-right neo-Nazi racist white supremacist. I'm just an America first nationalist and a MAGA supporter. Now, this is a clever tactic. It is. Donald Trump is many things. He is not a white supremacist and he is not an anti-Semite. Donald Trump moved the American embassy to Jerusalem in a bold move of solidarity with the people of Israel. He has a roundabout named for him in Jerusalem. Trump Heights, Ramat Trump, is named for him in the Golan Heights. Donald Trump has nothing to do with these so-called self-proclaimed America first asshats. In fact, he's very close to one of the people they attack the most, Charlie Kirk. Right? Donald Trump regularly invites Charlie to official meetings in the Oval Office. But you know, these people bought some MAGA hats, so the left will spread their lie and they know it, which is why Again, they're encouraging people to wear MAGA hats to events, so be on the lookout. That doesn't mean everyone with a MAGA hat is an alt-writer, obviously. What I'm saying is that the vast majority of people who wear MAGA hats are not alt-writers. I'm saying the alt-right is looking to disguise themselves specifically for purposes of publicity. Okay, step two, then you declare yourself the true conservatives, the true heirs to conservatism. Right? Not a bunch of masturbating losers who live in your mother's basement. No, you're the true heirs of conservatism. The way you do this is that you simply lie about mainstream conservatives. You suggest that mainstream conservatives are insufficiently committed to social conservatism. So, one of the things that all these people have been planning to do the last several weeks is they show up in the Q&A lines and they ask the same nine questions. So I'm just going to knock down these questions right now and then we can actually have a real Q&A with real questions. <laughs> Saves us time on the other end. So they've been showing up to events and asking people like my friend Dan Crenshaw, Republican of Texas and former Navy SEAL, Question. Nice. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I, 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 I have one question. Are you protesting the part where I'm condemning the Nazis? Like, you hear what I'm doing right now. Do you have ears? I'm literally condemning Nazis, and you're telling me to leave. Adding to the public discourse. You know what? Okay, good news. I have a microphone and speakers. And, um, you know, I've, it turns out that in my daily life, I, I deal with two screaming children under the age of six every single day. So, dealing with seven screaming protesters who are significantly less smart than my five-year-old and my three-year-old is really not that much of a challenge. Alrighty, so. Goodbye. In the words of President Trump, bye-bye. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you, I am, I'm extraordinarily puzzled. I'm standing up here bashing the living shit out of Nazis, and they're telling me I have to leave over it. Yeah, I noticed. Okay, so. Okay, so back to, we're going to get rid of all these questions so we don't have to deal with them in the Q&A. So a lot of these alt-writers have been showing up at various events, and they've been asking questions like, how does anal sex help us win the culture war? 
Really, this is the thing they've been asking. I mean, I'm not sure how them masturbating to pictures of frogs helps win the culture war either, but... The purpose is to simultaneously pose as edgy and also to preserve your ability to say that you are joking, but the goal is really to suggest that if you oppose the alt-right, you're in favor of destroying the traditional family, which is ridiculous. Now, the actual answer, the non-snarky answer to this ridiculous question, is that criminalizing consensual activity without externalities is by definition losing the culture war. Okay, what helps America win the culture war is freedom and liberty and the government not being involved in your life. And if you, like me, believe that certain personal activity is a sin, you know how you win that culture war? By having people join your church, by engaging with your community, by teaching your children your values. That's the way you win a culture war. In fact, in fact, I, I'm, I'm bewildered by it. There's great irony in watching alt-writers claim they should use the commanding heights of government to cram down their viewpoints on others, while complaining that the left uses the commanding heights of government to cram down their viewpoints on others. You can't really whine about using the government to shut down your viewpoint when you plan on using the government to shut down everybody else's viewpoint. But many folks on the alt-right are busy playing true believers by suggesting it was like me, people who wrote entire books on the evils of pornography in American society, or people like David French, who spend their days fighting for religious freedom in court, are standing ardently in favor of Drag Queen Story Hour at the local library. Okay, newsflash. I think Drag Queen Story Hours border on child abuse. I think parents who expose young children to sexualized cross-dressing adults are doing something wrong and bad. I also think, I also think that in governmental terms, if you allow the library to decide which speech to ban, it's much more likely to ban the Bible than Drag Queen Story Hour. I'm for limited government because I do not trust the government to decide what kind of speech it wants to ban. Okay, so now I'm gonna knock down a few of their Q&A questions about me personally. We can go through these real quick because I don't really care about them. First, they claim that I hate Jesus. Okay, I'm a Jew. I don't believe in Jesus. News. <laughs> My best friend and business partner is a lay minister. I employ tons of Christians. I've given them the freedom and the platform to share their faith. I've written one of the best-selling conservative books of all time that basically calls for more conservatives to go back to church and argues for the value of biblical religion. Okay, a couple more of these. They say that I want America to fight wars for Israel. Nope, nope. First of all, Israel can take care of herself. They say that I'm a chicken hawk. I want to send our boys to die, but I won't fight myself. Okay, reality. People who join the military are braver than I. They've sacrificed more than I. That is a fact. Also a fact. No one in America sends people to die. People volunteer for our military. The draft has not been in effect for several decades. The people who join our military, they're not victims, and nothing annoys them more than being treated as victims by people who use them as political pawns. They don't need protection from me. I, like every other American, I have opinions on how to use the American military, because we have civilian control of the military here in the United States, which is a very, very good thing. But suggesting that anybody who doesn't serve in the military can't have an opinion about the use of the military is like suggesting that anybody who is not a police officer can't have opinions about how the police ought to be used. By the way, our soldiers don't need the, the victimology, the sort of patting on the back of a bunch of weak, effeminate losers who live in mom's basement. They are protecting you. They are stronger than you. Okay, other ones. I attacked the Covington kids. I mean, this one is so absurd. I literally was on the phone with the Covington. I know them personally. I was on the phone with them nearly every night, guiding them in the media and through legal strategy. Okay, I haven't revealed that publicly until now, but now that this accusation is out there, I may as well say it. You can call them. You can ask them. Okay, they, they, they also suggest, these folks, that I didn't defend so-and-so when, when they were banned from social media. That's probably a lie. I've basically defended everyone from being banned from social media, including people who have targeted me and, and created risk threats for me. It, okay, another one they like, that I'm a grifter, right, that I make money. Welcome to America. We have lots of sponsors. I'm very grateful for my sponsors. And I'm not going to apologize for the fact that I offer my sponsors a way to reach my audience. I'm very proud of them. I think their products are good. That's why I talk about them. And if it makes me money at the same time, great. I'm out to make money. I like money. Congratulations. It's a free market economy. Okay, now to a few of their more policy-based claims. When you aren't lying about me or Matt Walsh or Charlie Kirk or David French or Dan Crenshaw, these folks are busy playing defender of the realm by suggesting that all immigration be shut down on the basis of race. Not on the basis of economics, on the basis of race. 
Let's be clear, every country has the right and duty to defend its borders. I was for a Trump wall before Trump was for a Trump wall. But legal immigration has been overall, not always, but overall, a massive boon to the United States. In periods in which it is not, that's because government has basically failed to take into account economic, education, and cultural status of new immigrants. The government should take all those factors into account. Again, economic, educational, and cultural status, all of that should be taken into account. And then we should welcome new immigrants who benefit the United States. This is all very logical. By the way, I'm confused by the idea that we should not be attempting to create a brain drain to the United States by drawing immigrants who are highly qualified here. If you're America first, why don't you want more smart, principled people coming into the United States to make us stronger and simultaneously drain other countries? Then you get the questions about Israel and suggesting that if you're pro-Israel, this means prioritizing America over Israel. That's, that's absolute nonsense. If America had a policy that was not good for Israel but was good for America, I would back it. They talk about the USS Liberty incident. There have been multiple studies, US Navy, Joint Chiefs of Staff, CIA, House, Senate, NSA. Most of the reports, according to historian Richard Brownell, do not assign culpability for the incident. They focus on communications failures. I have to say I'm a little bit bewildered why you're so obsessed with an incident that is now 52 years old. If you have theories that are better than those of the American government, they've got operators standing by, feel free to dial them and tell them about your five decade old theories about a military incident from the 1967 Six Day War. It's of direct and vital interest now in 2019. Okay, speaking of Europe, they tend to say that they, they like white European ideals. Not Western ideals, Western ideals would be a thing, right? Because I, you can read about Western ideals in books. White European ideals. I'm wondering exactly what they're talking about. They're not talking about Christian ideals, you can read about those in books too, right? Or Judeo-Christian ideals, which I talk about, right? Instead, they talk about white European ideals. I'm, I'm confused which, what are white ideals? What do white ideals look like? Do white ideals look like you know, like the professors at these universities who are overwhelmingly light, white and overwhelmingly socialist? What do white ideals look like? How about European ideals, like the socialists over in, in various parts of Europe? Are you really happy with how Germany is being governed right now, are you? Like, what, are, what do European ideals look like to you? Do, do the white communists at Berkeley have these white European ideals? Race does not have ideals. It's just a melanin level. Okay, it's just a skin color or a place of origin. If you think it does, you are you are absolutely indistinguishable. You are identical to the identity politics left, to the intersectional left. And spoiler alert, the alt-right is. And then the alt-righters talk about how white, white people are superior to others, but their own idiocy and bigotry demonstrates that isn't true. And they talk about the demographic shift in the country is ruinous. They point to the fact that non-white folk tend to vote Democrat, but this ignores that voting is malleable. The fact is that a huge percentage of California Hispanics vote for Democrats. 80% of Florida Hispanics currently favor Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Okay, Hispanics don't vote universally one way because, because race is not the basis for voting. Ethnicity is not the basis for voting. Culture may be the basis for voting, but ethnicity is not, race is not. Again, that is an uncontrollable factor. Culture is a different thing. That affects how people think. But none of this is about reality. Okay, so we have step one, and that is you masquerade as a maganic, and then we have step two, and that is you claim that you're the true believer. And then we have step three, which is to troll, right? You just show up at places like this and you say dumb things. She jokes about the Holocaust and cookies because, I mean, what, what could be funnier than that, obviously? I mean, that's just good stuff. And then finally, and this is the big one, you count on the left to help you out. And this is where this nefarious alliance that I've been talking about between the alt-right and the hardcore left comes in. And believe you me, the radical left will. I mean, we've seen proof of it here tonight. I'm here decrying for 40 minutes the evils of the alt-right and white supremacism, and there are people up there calling me an alt-right white supremacist. Okay, the left will literally call anybody on the right alt-right, even if we say vocally and in no uncertain terms that the alt-right is pure, unbridled, vile garbage. Even if members of the alt-right target those people on the mainstream right. Even if Donald Trump condemns the worldview. Listen, you can argue with anything mainstream conservatives say. It's a free country. We disagree with each other pretty frequently, but there's no doubt that mainstream conservatives are pretty easily distinguishable from the alt-right, but it doesn't matter, the media will lie about this anyway. So the Boston Globe will call my website, The Daily Wire, an alt-right outpost. We force them to recant. The Economist will call me the alt-right sage without the rage. We'll force them to recant. Over at Boston University, where I'm speaking next week, they're festooning posters of my face with a Hitler mustache, which makes perfect sense. <laughs> Students at this university will mob people trying to put up posters for a lecture. They'll tear down banners advertising the speech and replace it with a banner reading, Be Tolerant Except Racism. I challenge you to 
find anything in this speech or anything else I have said that is racist. Really, I'm waiting. Operators on standby. They'll issue a flyer that literally depicts me as a cockroach on a bottle of bug spray with the label Ben Be Gone. I do love that one, I will say. That was pretty great. <laughs> I think that my favorite thing about that is that these people, they hear dog whistles everywhere. Right? Donald Trump will say something and they will, oh, it's a dog whistle. I say Judeo-Christian values. And then they say, oh, that's a dog whistle. When I say Judeo-Christian values, I mean white people. <laughs> Which is obviously untrue. Dog whistles everywhere, just dog whistles everywhere. And then they put out a poster literally with an Orthodox Jew on a bottle of extermination spray with me as a bug. That's not a dog whistle. That's you howling at the moon. I mean, my God. And then they're like, oh, well, you know, we just didn't know. We just... Funny, your, your antenna were up real high in terms of sensitivity for other groups. Weird that your antenna were just completely non-functional when it came to the Jews who don't rank on your intersectional hierarchy of victimhood. Very odd. For every other group, we have to be careful of dog whistles that don't even make sense. When it comes to the Jews, you're like, I'll put them on a bottle of Bug Be Gone, this Jew right here. Maybe it's, I have a feeling, it might be because, unfortunately, for the intersectional left, Jews don't actually count as a quote-unquote minority group. Right? The only minority groups are the ones that they perceive are victimized. Jews aren't victimized enough, despite the fact that on a per capita basis, Jews are the most victimized group in the United States by hate crimes. And it isn't particularly close, by the way. But it's not just the students at this university. The media will suggest that President Trump is in league with the alt-right. Even at this late date, they'll neglect the fact that Trump has repeatedly condemned white supremacism, that he has purged his administration of people who were remotely friendly with the alt-right, people like Steve Bannon. They'll simply overlook that Trump isn't a white supremacist. They'll declare that the MAGA hat is indeed a Nazi swastika. So, clarification for people on the left who apparently can't listen or read. If someone believes that all men are created equal, and men means like mankind, that's, that's what the word meant when it was written in the Declaration of Independence, you idiots. If someone believes that all men are created equal, that every American should have equality before the law, in free market capitalism, in small government, in equal rights for people of all races, that person is not on the alt-right. In fact, they despise the alt-right, and the alt-right despises them. But people on the left know this, they just prefer the lie. Why? Because their goal is time splashed a photo collage on their front page of me and Milton Friedman and Dave Rubin and Richard Spencer. The goal was to lump everybody together and then suggest that we are radicalizing the American population as though Richard Spencer and I have a damn thing in common. For the first, for the first thing, I can read. <laughs> Political correctness is a weapon for the left, but it's also a weapon for the alt-right. However, Professor Steven Pinker, who the left tried to cancel for saying this, made this clear last year. He was saying that political correctness is a way for the left to shut down debate. By shutting down the debate, they actually open the door to the alt-right because they say, you can't ask certain questions. Then the questions get asked, they shut it down, and people go, wait, I'll just look online for the answer. And the first answer they find might be something from an alt-right website, and they start to take it more seriously, right? This is something Steven Pinker said. So the left called them alt-right and shut them down. There is something that's the most nefarious of all when it comes to these sort of de facto playing off each other political lines between the far left and, and the alt-right. And that is that they actually mirror themselves in politics and culture. They both have an identity politics view. As I say, the left's view of American politics is that Americans can be identified by group. Americans are black or Hispanic or white or green or Jewish or lesbian or, in the best of all possible worlds, a half Native American, half black, little person who is gender fluid. Right? If, you, if, you, if you're on the left, you don't describe people by their belief system or by what they do. You describe them by their attributes. You describe them by group attributes. And they have a whole intersectional hierarchy deciding how victimized you are based on how many of these boxes you check. The only difference between the left and the alt-right is that they reverse the hierarchy, meaning that the left thinks that hierarchy is bad. Right? They create this hierarchy where white people are the most powerful, and then progressively you go all the way down to the bottom, and you get to the LGBT people, and those are the people who are the least powerful according to this hierarchy. And they say that hierarchy is bad, we should just flip the hierarchy. And then you have the alt-right, and they say, no, 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 the hierarchy is good, and we should keep the hierarchy the way that it is. And then there's all the rest of us who are like, what hierarchy? There shouldn't be a hierarchy. What the hell are you talking about? We're individuals. We live in a free country. All of this is terrible for the country. It's terrible for the discourse. We should be able to ask tough questions and answer them. We should. We should be able to have conversations. And we should also be able to see the difference between good, fact-based, rational answers, and identity politics bullshit pandering, which is a specialty, unfortunately, of both the radical left and the alt-right. But the left won't have the conversation. The alt-right really doesn't want to either. They prefer memeing and trolling and all the rest. So here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Anyone on the right or left who wants to have an actual conversation about tough issues, that isn't the bumper sticker, but is also not willing to pretend that ugly bigotry is decency, or that identity politics reflects truth, or that trollish memeing is a substitute 
for an actual worldview. Let's have the conversation. Thanks so much. Happy to take your questions. Thank you, everyone. It's time to start the question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question, please walk around to the back of the hall, back of the house, stand behind the pink line by the usher, and he'll guide you uh, up to.